Yo, my fortress, my provider. That's who you are. That's who you are. <laughs> how many had a good, are having a good time at church today? So glad to see every one of you here. I had all the words messed up. You know, I'm one of those people that could be in church my whole life and not know one song. <laughs> Is anybody like that? Like, I like, I like, like. We've been singing that your whole life, still don't know it. And my family's completely different. Like, they have this, this memory that's out of this world. Like, they hear a song once and they know all the songs. And, and I'm like, okay. Like, what I do is lip sync fake. <laughs> I try to act like it. But, um, but I love you guys. I'm so glad you're here. And I love that we're able to study the word, get together, because life can be really rough and tough. And it's so great that we get to start over every week to get our focus back on our answer, which is God. And you might feel alone in this room today, but you're not alone. God's here with you. And this is just a reminder. I'm here. I'm your provider. I'm, that's who I am. And I, I am. this is what's going to happen today. We're going to learn the Word of God. We're going to grow. And, and how we really grow is hearing the Word, understanding it, and then applying it. Hearing the word, understanding it, and then apply. You want to grow. You want to get on fire for God. It's more than a prayer. Like, Lord, make me on fire. God says, no. Why don't you just hear my word, obey it, and you'll be on fire. Just obey it. You'll be on fire, right? You know, so I'm glad you're here today. Everyone online that's tuning in. This is the Sunday after Easter, and you're still here. Give yourselves a hand. Let's This Wednesday night, we're going to start our series on the end times, and we have the greatest, really one of the greatest speakers on end times in the whole world. He's going to be here. Don't miss it. He's coming all the way from New York, all the way to here, to San Bernardino. He rarely ever makes it to the West Coast. Um, so let's make sure we show him that, you know, we know how to praise God. We're here to learn, and you don't want to miss this series. That's starting this Wednesday, and then Sunday we'll pick it up again. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for this time that we have to study your word. Help us to understand it. Transform our lives through this word. When you speak, miracles happen. All you said was, let there be light. And then there was light on earth. Stars, the moon, the sun, the billions of galaxies that are out there were all created by your spoken word. So I thank you, Lord, as we're here today, one word can turn our whole world upside down, can restore us, can heal us, can transform us, can set us free from years of addiction, can turn hopeless situations into places of great vision and life. Have your way today with every one of us, because every one of us really matter to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be <laughs> I said, I, you know, I said you may be baptized. Because I'm going to be talking about baptism. That's how, that sounded kind of Catholic. You may be baptized, right? <laughs> All right. Today we are going to talk about baptism, and the title is Get Baptized. And many of us have been in church our whole lives and never really heard a teaching on what baptism is. And for so many of us, we have a wrong understanding of what baptism is. When I was a little boy, I, you know, as a baby... They took me to get christened, and, and, I, and that was considered my baptism. But in Scripture, we see baptism as a choice that adults make or people that have comprehension make a decision that I'm going to get baptized. It's not something that someone can force you to do, intimidate you to do. It's something that you willfully do when you've made a decision to follow Jesus with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your strength. Basically, baptism is saying this, I'm 100% in. Uh, we understand some of those commitments for some of us that grew up in na bad neighborhoods. If you want to join the local gang, you were, actually, you were actually jumped in. And they were saying, okay, you want to be in this gang? You're going to have to jump in. You know, and it's the same thing with Christianity. We got to jump in. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, we're not going to jump in. But baptism is kind of like jumping in, right? It's like jumping in all the way. I'm 100% in. I've seen people uh, like go to church for years 
and not been baptized. And I think some of it, the reason they have not been baptized, and I'll say publicly, it's a public, baptism is a public thing, not a private thing. So you're not going to, you're not going to, we don't want you getting baptized in a secret, uh, a secret bathtub, you know, in, in, dark, in a dark cellar. And God said, God knows. It's not about God knowing. God already knows. But it's you being public about it and then saying, I'm living for Jesus. And I want everybody to know I'm, I'm going public with this. Right? I'm serving God. Baptism. Baptism, in the simplest term, is just being immersed in water. And we're going to talk about what it means as a Christian to be immersed in water. But I want to give you a background on, and insights on baptism. Like, where did this all begin? Because I wasn't sure. But as I looked at Scripture, we found out that the first person that was doing baptisms was a man named John the Baptist. John the Baptist was the first person in Scripture to perform baptism. Before that time, there was nobody in the history of the earth that was baptizing. And in Mark 1.14, it says, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. This is what, what John was doing. He was saying, you need to be get baptized as a sign that you've repented of your sins. And why would he be talking about repentance of sin? Because the majority of people at that time, even the religious people thought that they were okay or they thought they were good or they considered themselves self-righteous. The person that you can't help is a person that does not admit they need help. You can never be set free from a sin that you're not even agreeing it's a sin. You'll never be set free from alcoholism until you admit, yeah, I'm an alcoholic. Like everybody around you might know you're an alcoholic and, and you might be denying it, but the truth is, until you admit it, you can't get set free. The, the idea here is that, that John was saying, look, you, we're all sinners. We're all in the same boat and we all need forgiveness and we all need to repent of our sins, and we all need a savior. There's not a person in this room, and you say, or are you telling me I'm bad? This is what I'm saying. All of us understand we have some good stuff in us, but overall, every single one of us is a sinner. We've all lied. How many, how many have lied in this place? If you're not raising your hand right now, you're lying. <laughs> right? Everybody's lied. Um, let's do this, let's do this test. Have you ever lusted? You don't have to raise your hands on I know. We're good. Calm down. Yeah, I, I just, I'm lusting right now. No, I'm just kidding. Right? But, but the idea, Jesus said this, if you, if you lust after a woman, you've already committed adultery in your heart. Now, that's cold-blooded. Because in the Old Testament, he was talking about, uh, talking about adultery, that you actually carry out that you carry it out. You're not just fantasizing about it, but you're doing it. And God is saying, yeah, I'm, even, I'm even looking at your fantasy life. And if you're fantasizing about committing adultery, you are an adulteress in your heart. And you know that. You don't want your wife, if you're married, fantasizing about another man. I, I don't know why I went there, but it went real quiet. Like, uh. <laughs> but that's the reality. It, it, and God is saying, you could, you could, like, you, you could, you could be following me in your, in your mouth, but, but understand, I know your heart. And every one of us need forgiveness of sins. And it doesn't make you worse than anybody else. The idea is we're all in the same boat and we need to admit we're sinners and we need to be willing to repent of our sins and then we'll be forgiven of our sins and then we'll become a brand new person. But I got to admit it. And that's where Alcoholics Anonymous or, or any, any other form of help or this is what they have you confess, I'm an alcoholic. And they found out until you admit what you are, there's no hope for you. You got to admit, I'm, like, I am chronically angry. Don't just, just, I'm angry. I get mad at everybody. I, like, people just look at me wrong. I want to fight them. They, 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 on the freeway, I flip everybody off. Like, what, Christian? And then you have the waste sticker on your back. Don't take this sticker off. Right? Don't, you're not pointing them to Jesus or the way. Right? So now, now John the Baptist says, in order to be baptized by John, this is what he said, he had one requirement, that repent of their sins. Just like baptism is not a popular subject even on, in churches nowadays. And I'll tell you why baptism is not a popular subject in churches nowadays. Because being fully committed to Christ is not popular either. 
Most people are more committed to their personal happiness than they are to serving God. We're more committed to our sports teams than we are God. We're more committed to the things that we have than we are God. You know? And so baptism represents, look, first of all, repent of your sins. Don't even get baptized till you repent. Baptism has requirements. That means if you're not willing to turn from your sin, don't get baptized as a ritual. You're not ready. Because baptism represents a decision that you made that I'm done doing it my way. I'm done doing it my selfish ways. I'm done, I'm done with adultery. I'm done with the fornication. I'm done with the sexual morality. I'm done with the lying. I'm done with the cheating. I'm done with the gang banging. I am, I'm done with the anger. I'm done with the unforgiveness. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I'm following Jesus. Now the Holy Spirit will lead you to a place that you're done. And when he does lead you there, be done. The word repent means, this is a, the message that John the Baptist preached. Repent means to feel or express sincere regret or, or remorse about one's wrongdoing or sin and willfully turning away from it. So it's not just sorry that you got caught. Have you ever been, no, you have to raise your hand on this one either. <laughs> have you ever been sorry that you got caught? And, and, and some of us are like really great liars. I mean, we're so good at lying. I think we believe our lies. Like we got a picture you walking into that motel room with that girl. Not me. <laughs> Same tattoo on your neck. I know that people like me. I, do you think I'm the only one that has that tattoo? <laughs> we start lying. We start believing our lies. But the reality is God knows. And there has to be a time in your life that you're not just sorry that you got caught, that you're so done with it that you're willing to turn away from it. You guys got that? So there was a requirement. Only those who admit and repent of their sins are forgiven and cleansed. That means if I don't admit that what, what this is what we're saying, what God calls sin, I call sin. So I'm not getting my standards from the world. I'm not getting my standards from some professor in some university. I'm not getting my standard from some magazine or book that I read. I'm getting my standard from the Bible. And what he calls sin, I call sin. But why don't people want to repent of their sins? The reason we don't want to repent of our sins is because we enjoy the short-term pleasure of it. It's fun while it lasts. And I will say this, it's fun while it lasts, but there finally comes a time that you're chasing after the first high and you can't find it again. It's no longer fun. You've now become a slave to the sin. And now you see the repercussions, you see the destruction to your family, the destruction of your mind, and you're saying, man, this has to stop, but there's now a problem. What you thought you could stop, you can't stop. How many people I talk to, I can stop anytime. Stop now then. Well, I don't want to stop now. No, you don't want to stop now, but understand this. You can't stop now. Unless there's a God that comes and saves you and sets you free, you can't stop. But let's talk about it. But if we freely, 1 John 1, 9, it says, if we freely admit that we have sinned and confess our sins, if we freely admit that we have sinned and confess our sins, now, I love this. I like to watch those documentaries of people that get arrested and then they put them in the box with the investigators and they're, try, they're trying to, like, you know, you got a right to remain silent. I love that. How many like those, watch those things? No, you don't have to raise your hand. Just kidding. <laughs> but uh, you have the right to remain silent. And then, and they said, do you, do you want to exercise your right? You could call a lawyer anytime you want. No, I want to talk. Okay, well, let's talk. And the whole time they're, they're putting the pressure on them and they're trying to get them to confess what they did. They're trying to get them to confess what they did so they could put them behind bars and be done for life at times. But God is not putting a vice grip on you to confess your sins, to put you in a prison. God is trying to get you to confess your sins to set you free from the prison. 
Somebody here today, you walked in here with depression and you walked here with anxiety. You walked here with a lot of fear. You walked here with hopelessness. You walked here with a suicidal spirit. And God is saying, if you just admit that you sin, I'm not here to put you in a prison. I'm here to set you free. And I'm here to give you a brand new life. I know what the, I know how to fix you. All you got to do is admit that you need my help. Admit that you need my forgiveness. Admit that I can set you free. He'll do it. But if we confess our sins, he doesn't put us behind bars. He is faithful and just, true to his nature and promises, and will forgive our sins and cleanse us continually from all unrighteousness, all wrongdoing, everything not in conformity with his will. He goes, I'll forgive you, and then I'll cleanse your record. I'll literally give you a brand new start today. You could leave here scot-free, guilt-free, and you can leave here with a brand new start. And when God forgives you, forgive yourself. I love this. And I know people aren't like this. So stop judging God by the people in your life. Because people in your life, they'll say, I'm, uh, I forgive you. But the next second, they're bringing it up again. I thought you said you forgave me. I know, but I, I don't trust you. And it looks like you're going down that path again. I, I ain't forgetting. I ain't dumb. But that's how people are. But when God forgives you, he cleanses you too. That means... This is what I love about God. He'll forgive you and he'll set you free from the demon you let in your life. Because it's not just being forgiven. Jesus, cleanse me. Deliver me from everything that's wrong within me. Everything that's wrong in my character. And send me free from any demon that I let in my life. Jesus, forgive me and cleanse me. Set me free. I love it. This is for real. So baptism was a requirement from John, but baptism, but repent, I mean, it was a requirement, but repentance of sin was a requirement of sin, of sin is still a requirement today. So it was a requirement then, but it's a requirement today for baptism. Without repentance, you shouldn't be getting baptized. In Acts 2.38, it says, Peter replied, Peter is now saying this. This is after John the Baptist already died. Peter replied, each of you, must repent of your sins. That means repenting of your sins is a must. You cannot get baptized and you're in an adulterous affair. And, and, and think that God's endorsing you because he lets you get baptized and you don't get electrocuted. We're going to see if I don't get electrocuted, it's God's will. No, God will have mercy on you, but the baptism didn't count. All that happened, you went, down a, you went down a dry center and you came up a wet center. All you did was take a bath. You should have did that at home. But if you want a supernatural experience, you got to finally say, I, I know I'm in an adulterous affair and I have every excuse to be in that adulterous affair because my wife or my husband, you know, they're dogs and this and that. And who let the dogs out? You have all kinds of stuff to say about your family. But the reality is you got to stop making excuses. You're responsible for your, you're responsible for your decision. You're responsible for your family. And you might even say, man, I love the person I'm with, but you got to make a decision that you love God more than you love your sin. I'm getting a few golf claps in here. You must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized. So baptism is a must as well. In the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. God promises two blessings to everyone who repents of their sins and, be and believes in Jesus and is baptized. God promises two, bl two blessings. Two blessings to anyone who repents of their sin and believes in Jesus Christ as their Lord and is baptized. Number, number one promise, forgiveness of all sins. Number two promise is receive the gift and infilling of the Holy Spirit. Now that's big. Now when you repent of your sins and you get baptized, this is not what God gives you, a gift of membership in a church. Be careful that you're not a member of a church and you're not saved yet. Because when you stand before God, you're not going to be able to say, why should I, let's say he asks you, why should I let you in? You're going to say, I was a member of the Way World Outreach. He goes, no, 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 you missed it all. They did not teach you 
that you needed salvation and there's only one name to call on to be saved and his name is Jesus Christ, that he's a source of eternal life. Did you not, did you, did you hear that there's no way to come to the Father but through the Son, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father. Did you not hear that you're a sinner and need to repent of your sins? Did you not hear that Jesus died and suffered for all the wrong that you've done so you could die in, in peace? You could die with eternal life, not die in sin and not die with the wrath of God over you. You could have been forgiven. Membership doesn't do it. So when, when you get baptized, he doesn't give you the gift of religion. Well, it, because I, I tell you this, some of us name drop a church and name drop a religion when God's talking about eternal life. Well, I'm a this or I'm a that. Huh? That don't matter. Are you a believer in Jesus Christ? Have you been saved? And this is the idea. This scripture is describing the born again experience. That means you repent of your sins, God forgives you, and then he fills you with his spirit. That changes everything. This is the real question. Have you been filled with God's spirit yet? The spirit of Jesus inside of you to empower you to live a new life. Now, many of us believe in demonic possession. Uh, how many have seen the exorcist? Very good. A lot of us in the raise their hand, oh, well, I'm not supposed to watch horror movies, but I watched it. And what happened after you watched that? You got scared. You started hearing stuff in the house. Like... Some, of you, some of you guys went back to being a little kid and believing that Satan was underneath your bed. Like, don't put your leg out there. And I tell you why The Exorcist and those type of movies scare you so much. I'll tell you why they scare you so much. Because you know possession is real. So that's not like a, like a, like a vampire. I'm talking about, uh, you know, but I'm talking about uh, possession is real. That you could have a demon inside of you. Do you know right now there's people in this room right now that you got a demon inside of you? And you need that thing cast out of you? It's overpowering you, and you're in a cycle that you can't break. But I got good news for you. The same Jesus that cast out demons and set people free from tormented spirits is the same Jesus that's here today. Who the Son sets free is free indeed. In the name of Jesus, we command every evil spirit to go in the name of Jesus. Be free in the name of Jesus. So we believe in that. But how about, how about this? Being possessed by the Holy Spirit. Now that's a whole nother possession. Because when you're possessed by a demon, we could tell like, you be acting demonic. Like stuff you're saying is like demonic. Right? Do you have anybody in your family going on? <laughs> it's right here, right here. The devil's right here. But the reality is, is, is that that can happen. But being possessed of the Holy Spirit and being filled with the Holy Spirit is a gift of God. And when you're filled and baptized with the Holy Spirit, this is what happens. You start thinking like God. You start acting like God. You get filled with his power to overcome every single sin that you're dealing with. You start walking to the supernatural. This is what happens. You start experiencing the peace of God. And people start looking at you. You look like you've changed. I I have changed. I didn't change my church, but there was something that changed within me, changed from the inside out, that Jesus Spirit now lives in me. And I can say this, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can say this, greater is he that's in me than he that is in the world. Jesus is not found just in the church. Jesus is found in me. That's called being born again. That's called being what? Born again. When God's spirit comes inside of you and you're a new person. I'm telling you, when God's spirit comes inside of you, of course there's a war that begins because your old mindsets will begin to fight. But I said there's a new desire that's in you. There's a new voice in you. you I mean, if you could still go to the clubs 
and just have a good old time at the clubs without the Holy, without the Holy Spirit going with you. I'm telling you, it's different when you go with the Holy Spirit to the club. Because the Holy Spirit said, we should not be here. What are you doing dancing like that? That's like going to a club with your dad. What are you doing drinking that? Where are we going now after this club? Come on, the most miserable person in the club is a Christian. <laughs> Because you know you ain't supposed to be there. And the Holy Spirit's like, you're like, you're, you're bipolar. You wake up in the morning after you know you shouldn't have been with that. You don't even know his name. He didn't even give you a happy meal. And you're sleeping with him. Oh, hey, ho, oh, you don't stop. Come on, this is reality. Come on, this. Uh, the reason I talk about this, because this is real life. And then you wake up in the morning, if you're a Christian, and you're involved in that fornication, and you're involved in that relationship, you wake up depressed. You're crying. And the guy goes, what's up? <laughs> this is wrong, man. What's your name? <laughs> Why you, you're weird. Uh, no, man, I'm a Christian. I should not be doing this. This is called fornication. <laughs> Don't ever call me again, you little devil. <laughs> I'm going to understand. Because when you have the Holy Spirit in you, you can't continue to sin. And be comfortable with it. There's something within you. He's in you. He's not going to let you go. He's going to constantly be talking to you. Say, baby, come on. Come on, son. I deliver you from this. It's time for you to stop going back to it. Now, Jesus was baptized, which is interesting. Now, John the Baptist was the first person in Scripture that was baptizing people. The first person that was mentioned to be baptized by name was Jesus. It, Jesus. I mean, John the Baptist was baptizing other people, but it was just, it was no names until he came to this one. Now, Jesus was not baptized because he needed to repent of his sins because he was sinless. He was baptized to lead by example. He never asked us to do anything he doesn't do first. But baptism also represented that he was 100% submitted to doing the Father's will. We see this in the Garden of garden Gethsemane where Jesus is ready to go to the cross and he's ready to suffer and die. And then he, he says this, Father, is there any other way that I don't have to drink this cup? And he says, nevertheless, that will be done. But the real, the real prayer that he made at that was, was, it was here. He was restating what he committed to do here, here in prayer. This was at the beginning of his ministry. He was 30 years old when he got baptized. His mama didn't take him to get baptized. He didn't get baptized because someone forced him to do it. He got baptized out of his own free will, and it represented total commitment and total surrender to God, the Father's will. And he was also saying this, I'm committed to death. I got a mission to die, suffer, and die for the sins of mankind, and I will fulfill that commitment, and I will fulfill that mission. Father, help me. But I'm in. Now, understand this. The commitment to serve God is not less today. The same commitment that Jesus made is the same commitment that God wants all of his followers to make. This is not just a ritual. This is bigger than that. This is you saying, I've been born again. I'm saved. And I'm letting everybody know, family, come see me. I'm dunking myself underwater. And I'm coming out. And I'm letting you know, I'm a new person. The old person you knew is no longer here. I'm a follower of Jesus now. So what, is, what does baptism represent? Two things. The going under the water represents Jesus' death and burial and the death and burial of our old sinful life. What we're doing is we're following Jesus, not only in baptism, we're following Jesus in burial of our old life. That means before you could actually really follow Jesus, you have to have a personal funeral. You gotta be willing to die to your sin. 
The reason we struggle, and, and I, 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 I see a lot of church people struggle with a particular sin. The reason you struggle with, struggle with a particular sin, I'll tell you why. You've not buried it yet. And I know, because I've done that. In Colossians 2.12, I'll tell you the story. And you, uh, and I know you want to hear the gossip. <laughs> I'm going to tell you a story where Lisa was going to call the cops on me. You guys want to hear that? Please, Pastor, give me the juicy details. Ah. Okay. <laughs> All right, Colossians 2.12. And when you were baptized, and when you were baptized, it's assuming you got baptized. Now, understand, if you've not got, ba got, got baptized yet, get baptized. Let's go. If you backslidden and you went into the world for five years, you got to come back, get rebaptized. Because the first one you didn't mean. You didn't even know what you were doing, obviously. So let's do it for real now. Like, now you understand, I shouldn't be in there unless I've I've de I'm dead to the sin. So I'm done with that. It's, up your, it's your choice. But look, at, when you were baptized, it was the same thing as being buried with Christ. Buried with Christ. When we are getting baptized, we are publicly letting everyone know that we're breaking up with sin. It's a breakup. So I want to say break up with sin. So you're making a decision, I'm breaking up. I know a lot of us don't like breakups, but there's some good breakups. Could it be that you're right now depressed about someone you broke up with that caused you pain, suffering, never loved you the way you're supposed to be loved, and you're chasing after a breakup? And that breakup was the best thing that ever happened to you because you should never be in a relationship where someone doesn't value, as much, value you as much as you value them. You guys get that? Christian, come up here. We're going to talk about breaking up with sin and stop following sin and repenting. Okay, Christian's the devil. <laughs> Some of the, I'm the past I could just call to just do that kind of stuff. <laughs> All right, now, he's the devil. And when I'm following the devil, I follow the sins that he gives me, the temporary pleasures. And this is the problem. As long as I'm following the devil... I cannot follow Jesus. Jesus is calling me, Marco, it's time to repent. Turn from that sin. Turn from the pain. Turn from the cycles of destruction. Turn from the temporary pleasures. Follow me. I'll set you free. I'll give you the life you're looking for. But until I turn from the, him and turn from following sin and the devil, I can't turn to God. But there's a day that I say, I'm done with sin. I break up with you. I am done with you, to never go back with you, and then I renounce you. Get out of my life in the name of Jesus. I'm following Jesus. I submit to God. I resist the devil. Now flee. I'm following Jesus. I, right now, I'm moving towards my peace. I'm moving towards my joy. I'm moving towards my freedom. I'm moving towards my purpose. I'm moving towards meaning. Come on. I'm moving, moving towards restoration. I'm moving. It doesn't matter where I've been, how bad things are. We serve a God that takes broken sinners, and he brings them back together again. God could fix what you broke. And don't let the devil tell you it's too late. You messed up too much. We serve a God that could make up for lost time. Let's, come on, give him some praise. Come on, follow him. It's not too late. He can restore your family. Come on, he can restore your health. He can restore your mind. He can restore your dream. He can restore, come on, he can restore your business. God says, that's what I do. I take broken sinners that have messed up their lives. And if they're willing to turn away from their sin and bury it, I will resurrect them so they can have a new life. We got to break up. Look at Romans 6, 11. And even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin. And your relationship to it broken. Break up. But alive to God in unbroken fellowship with him and Jesus Christ. All I'm saying is, I break up with the devil and sin. And I enter into an unbroken relationship with Jesus. And this commitment I'm making is forever. I'm going to live for him. 
for the rest of my, come on, is anybody right here? So I'm going to live for Jesus, not for a temporary. We're not just checking this out. I'm committed till the day I die. And until you're willing to repent of your sins and bury it, it's alive in your life. And the big, one of the biggest problems I had, and I've told you guys this before, was jealousy. And I, I went through a whole year with Lisa, torturing her and allowing the devil to torture me. For a whole year, we, I, we had zero peace in our relationship before we got married. I began to accuse her of all kinds of horrible things that the devil was telling me about her. And, I, and I, would, I, would, I would interrogate her. And I would say, okay, let, let, I just have a few questions. When you, if you answer these questions good, we're good. We I mean, no problems. Just be honest with me. Okay? Did you love anybody else but me? <laughs> what a dumb question, right? I remember it was so bad that she, she would tell me, she would tell me whatever her answer was. And I'd go, man, you're lying. And you see the way you're studying? Ta -ta 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 -ta. You know why you're ta -ta 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 -ta? You're just trying to think what you need to say. Why don't you just spit out? You know why you, spit, you can't spit it out the way it's supposed to be said? In a clear sentence? It's because you're trying to think of the next lie you're going to say. So. Then, and, then she, and then she'll be quiet. I know why you're being quiet because you don't have nothing to say, right? You're lying. I mean, it was, a re it was pain. And then she, even the music's going on right now. You can feel the pain. We're adding some drama to this. And then Lisa started crying. <laughs> it was, she started crying. But the, it got so bad, I remember the visitor, I went to visit her house, and I started um, like giving her the third degree again. And then she, she, she had one of those, like, those iron, Iron screen doors. They couldn't really see in, but she was on the other side. And I go, open the door. She goes, I'm not opening the door. She goes, she goes you're crazy. I go, open the door. She goes, no, I'm not opening the door. You're crazy. And then she said, which was, it was the worst. I'm going to call the police on you. And I'm a youth pastor. And she would not open that door and I, it don't matter what I told her and I left but it was like that for a whole year and then I would come to church I said God forgive me God forgive me God forgive me and then I'd go back and do it again and I, and I started asking God God why am I still doing it what's wrong why didn't you set me free he goes I've not set you free because you've never repented of it. I've not set you free because you haven't been willing to bury it. I will set you free when you're done with it. You always seem to have one more question. And some of you guys right now always seem to have one more round, just one more high, just one more drink, just one more night, just one more weekend. And until you make up your mind that it's over with, I am done. I'm repenting of my sins. I'm burying that thing. You'll never be set free from it. But I finally said, God, forgive me and set me free. He goes, okay, this is repentance, he told me. You never, ever ask another jealous question again. And I'm, I'm not saying I wasn't tempted to ask another jealous question, but I called Lisa, I was in Chafee College when I'd said that prayer, and I called Lisa, come, I wanna talk to you after, after school, after that class, and she probably thought I was gonna interrogate her one more time, but I was not gonna interrogate her one more time. I was gonna tell my testimony that I not really say class. I made up my mind that I'm done, I'm burying that sin. I'm no longer gonna ask another jealous question again. I'm so sorry for hurting you and not accepting that God has forgiven you and that you're a woman of God, and I'm very privileged to have you as my future wife. Baby, I'm sorry, we both cried over there. Cal I mean, at, at Chafee College in a parking lot and I never asked her another jealous question again. Because when you get set free and you're really done with it, this is what happens next. Baptism represents also the death, but it also represents 
the coming out of the water represents Jesus' resurrection from the dead and our lives being raised to new life in Christ. Well, God is saying, you died, but now there's a resurrection. Come on, now you're alive. Now you're empowered. Now you have my spirit. Now you can do what you couldn't do. That's being empowered by the spirit. Stop expecting a resurrection when there hasn't been a death. You gotta die. And stop trying to taper off from sin, cut it off, be done with it. You don't know, like, like, there's certain sins that you, you, you know you can't taper off. I'm gonna start tapering off on murderers, I'm gonna try to do a little less of them. But, but you apply, you would never taper off from that, you gotta stop doing it. But how crazy other stuff that you think, oh, that's not that bad. You stop trying to taper off. You're going to have to cut the porn. Come on. You're going ha to have to cut the adulterous affair. You're going to have to cut the sexual immorality. You're gonna, come on. You're going to have to cut the cheating and the hustling and the lying. You're going you to have to cut it and say, I am done in the name of Jesus. Jesus, give me the power to say yes to you and no to the devil and no to sin. Give God some praise if you want that power. And this is the last verse. This is the last verse in Colossians 2.12. In the back side of the verse says, Then you were raised after the death. Then you were raised to a new life because you had faith in the power of God who raised Christ from, the, from, from death. That same power that raised Christ from death wants to raise you to have a brand new life today. How do you come to Jesus? You just come the way you are. My part and your part is to admit that I'm a sinner. Admit that I'm backslidden. You walked away from the Lord. Humble yourself and walk back. A big part of, 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 of baptism is, is humbling yourself. And until you humble yourself in baptism and in gratitude and, in, and, and with an attitude of repentance, that's what's going to happen. Nothing's going to change. Today's your day. God's trying to set you free. He's not trying to put you in a prison. He's not trying to hurt you. He wants to save you. He wants to make you whole. He loves you. He has a plan for your life better than any plan you've ever had for your life. And some of us, you know, we have some pet sins that you keep going to as your escape. And we've all had them. And God is saying, if you just stop going there and just start coming to me, I'll give you everything that you're looking for. The peace. The scripture says, in my presence, God, God says, in my presence, there's pleasures forevermore. Amazing. He goes, when you get in my presence, you start experiencing what true pleasure is. True pleasure doesn't leave you with a hangover, ruining your family, and a disease in your body, and losing everything that you worked so hard for. True pleasure leads you to growth, and it leads you to next levels of peace and joy and purpose. It's an abundant, full life. But only those that totally surrender their lives to the Lord will experience that. Now understand, it's not your willpower, it's His power. You just have to be willing. Today's your day to repent of your sins. Turn to Jesus as your Savior. And then after that, we're going to sign you up for baptism. And bring all your crazy family. When they see you get baptized, they might not believe that you've changed. But you're going to show them how you've changed. You're going to love them and you're going to forgive them. You're not going to be perfect. You're going to be real and you're going to be loving and you're going to forgive them and you're going to keep on going and they're not going to recognize you a year from now as you continue walking with the Lord. Make up your mind like Jesus did. At 30 years old, he made a commitment. I'm all in to the point of death. I'm going to count to three and I'm going to ask you a serious question. Life is very short and there's a lot of things that we're talking about in the last days, and this Wednesday we're going to talk about the last days and what's happening now that was prophetically speaking, talking about signs that are happening now that have to do with Jesus' return. He's coming back. He came the first time, and there was thousands of years of prophecy before Jesus showed up. And people thought, ah, oh, he ain't showing up. He showed up, and he's going to come back again. And be careful that you don't get caught sleeping, like not alert. And you're just going about your daily business without an awareness within you that today could be that day. 
that Jesus Christ come back. And I'm gonna tell you this, today could be the day that you also breathe your last breath. I just visited one of my friends in, in the hospital and he was the general manager of three stores and making a lot of money just a couple years ago in, in the high desert, managing three stores, doing great. And all of a sudden, he gets a pain that shoots up right up to his head and right down to his, like a kidney. He goes to the doctor and they find out they had five minutes to le live when they found him. And he had, the back of his heart was ex ready to explode and they had to do emergency operation on him to keep him alive. He didn't know that within five minutes he was going into eternity. I just went to visit him in the hospital. He's still recovering, but he got on, he, he, he rides Harleys and he got on his Harley, still recovering, and he goes like five miles per hour in, in his complex where he lives, going to the Denny's across the street, and he tries to avoid a speed bump, and the bike falls on him, breaks his pelvis, breaks his ribs, breaks his collarbone, breaks his hip, and now he's in a convalescent home right now, a man that was on top of the world. I'm just saying how things could shift so quick. All I'm saying is don't wait until it's too late to realize you need Jesus. Every knee's gonna bow one day, but the only ones that count for salvation are ones that bow on this side of the earth. You're gonna bow on the other side and admit that he's Lord, but it's gonna be too late for you. Don't play Russian roulette with your future. It's time to let it go. And God just wants to give you the full life you've been looking for. An abundant, full, rich, and satisfying life is found in Jesus Christ. You can have it. Does God want you to succeed in life? Of course he does. He wants you to do well. He wants your relationships to work out. He wants you to, to progress. He wants you to get vision and accomplish it. He wants, you to have he, wa he wants you to have battles, but have victory in your battles. All that, it's life. But give your life to Jesus. Stop seeking after things and seek after the Lord and he'll add the things to your life. Come on, God wants you, serving God is a better life. It's not a less life. Give your life to Jesus. Be saved. Now, I'm gonna count to three and I want you to raise your hand. You're saying, that's me, pastor. I want forgiveness of my sins. I'm ready to repent. I'm ready to bury my sins. May today be a funeral of my old life. I wanna live a new life and I want God to help me. How do you come to Jesus? The way you are. If today were your last day on earth, do you know where you spend eternity? If you say, pastor, I don't know. The only way to know is by you calling on Jesus to save you. And he will save you if you just admit that you're a sinner in need of a savior. We're all sinners in need of a savior. Nobody's better than nobody in this place. I'm not better than you. You're not better than me. We need Jesus. He's the savior. I'm not your savior. He's the savior. He loves you. I'm going to count to three. Say, man, that's, my, that's me. I want to give my life to Jesus. And then I want to follow in baptism. One, I want to know before I leave this building that I said yes to Jesus. I want you to raise your hand when I say three. Raising your hands is saying yes. If you feel like, man, I should, then do it now. Don't let that voice stop you. Your greatest enemy is not the devil. Your greatest enemy is not a person in your life. Your greatest enemy is a thought that stops you from believing in Jesus and giving your life to him. Two, and when I say three, be bold. This is a public thing. Jesus died publicly for you. Come on, he, he was baptized publicly. And now God has said, come on, you publicly give your life to me. One, two, three. Raise your hands all over this building. Say, I'm ready. Proud of you, proud of you, proud of you, proud of you. Proud of you over there in the corner. Proud of you guys. Yes, 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 yes. Anybody else over here? Anybody over here? I see those hands way in the back. Okay. I want all of us to stand up. This is your day. Surrender your whole life to the Lord. I want those that raise their hands to do me one more big favor. This is your first step of following Jesus. And what I want you to do, this is, this is you saying, I'm following Jesus. Faith without action produces no results. That means there's somebody here in this room that you didn't raise your hand yet, but there's a war within you. And this is your moment. This is the greatest opportunity of your life. If you raise your hand, I just want you to, I want you to come up here real quick. I want to pray with you. If you raise your hand, come up here real quick. I want to pray with you. We're not going to embarrass you. We're going to pray. We're going to pray that God fills you with the Spirit, forgives you of every single sin, and gives you a new life. Let's give them a hand as they're coming forward. Ask your neighbor. If you want to go up there, I'll go up there with you. 
Ask your neighbor, you want to go up there? Come on, there's somebody here that you're sitting here. It's time to recommit your life to the Lord. It's time to give your life to Jesus. Come on, your family's dependent on it. Your marriage is dependent on it. You're thinking you can't do it. And God says, you can't do it, but I can do it. I just need you to be willing. Come on, cooperate with God. Cooperate with God. Surrender your life to Jesus. Come on, recommit your life to the Lord. Come on, you were, you were, you were saved to live on a fire life for God. Get back on fire with God. Don't let your pride get in the way. I don't care how long you've been a Christian and serving God. You know you need to come back and you're not on fire. Get up here and get your fire back. Come on, get your, come on, get your mission back. Come on, get it back. You lost your first love. Get it back. You've been going through the motions. Tony. This is my, one of my best friends. We went to elementary school together. I'm so proud of him. I'm glad you're back, Tony. We love you, man. We love you, Tony. Love you. Hey, we ain't separated no more. Okay? I'm gonna put you on a leash like, like that dog. love you guys okay I'm proud of every one of you God is proud of you when Jesus got baptized the Bible says this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased or says this is my beloved son that brings me great joy this decision right now that you're making gives the Lord come on you're making God happy because this brings me great joy okay love you love you love you love you God bless okay you could do it through Christ. Okay? You're going to be forgiven of your sins. You're going to be cleansed of every one of your sins. You're going to receive forgiveness for yourself too. Stop beating yourself up when God's forgiving you of stuff that he already, if he forgave you, you got to forget, receive it for real. I'm done. And when someone brings up your past, it, I know you're bringing it up and I know you don't trust me yet, but you just watch me. Just watch me. I'm living for Jesus. And I'm going to tell you this. It's, someone say commitment. You're making a commitment to follow Jesus. He's going to help you, but you got to start having new patterns of living. You got to keep coming to church. Every week you got to come to church. You got 160 hours a week. How do you know God's important in your life? You give him time. How can you, you're never going to be successful in any area you're not consistent in and you're not investing time in. So if you want to really start, I guarantee, give us a year of your life. Join all the classes that we have. And I guarantee you this, no one's going to recognize you in a year from now. You're not going to recognize yourself. You're going to be happier with who you are. You're going to be, come on, you're going to have to get some confidence back. People are going to start looking at you as a leader. They're going to say, can you give me some advice? And you're going to say, I got a lot of advice for you because I've learned a lot in this last year. Not that I know it all, but I learned a lot. Okay, we love you. And I'll say this, we're not going nowhere. Like me as a pastor, we ain't going nowhere. I'm going to be here till the day I die. That's my commitment. I already know my commitment. I'm going to be here till Jesus Christ comes back. And all we're saying is this church is going to be here till Jesus Christ comes back. You know what that means? You're going to have something consistent in your life. Your family might not be consistent, but here every single week, you're going to have a place you could call home. And we're going to love you no matter what. Okay? Let's surrender our lives to the Lord. Let's pray. Okay? Forgiveness. Proud of you, young man. Body has closed your eyes. Say, say, Jesus, I thank you for loving me so much that you've called me today. You've chosen me to follow you. Today, I repent of my sins. I turn away from my sin, from serving the devil, from doing it my way, to following you. Your will be done on earth the way it is in heaven take over my life I believe you died and you were buried for my sins and today I die and I bury my sin to follow you Jesus resurrect me now to a new life fill me now with your Holy Spirit 
with your fire, with your strength, with your love. I thank you, Jesus. I'm saved. I'm born again. I receive the free gift of eternal life. All my sins have been washed away. And from this day forward, I will follow you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Welcome to the family.